She did her undergraduate studies at the University of Amsterdam and received her PhD in political science from the University of Paris, too. We are very honored to have her on the ISU campus to give our keynote address. Please join me in welcoming Dr. De Jong to Idaho State University. Reinforces 
and legitimacy of unequal social, political, and economic arrangements in some of gender inequalities. Now, in our societies, we have tendencies to emphasize the gender differences. But if you look at both sex and gender objectively, you actually see that both sex and gender are more correctly seen as on a spectrum. Research tells us that the differences between men and women are actually quite small. Our physical and psychological similarities are great. We are about 90% the same, and there is only about 10% difference. And this graph represents the traits exhibited by men and women. And as you can see, the two bell curves largely overlap. Now, although our similarities are vast, we have a tendency of emphasizing and focusing on the differences. Our gender stereotypes, those of the previous slide, have a tendency to amputate these bell curves and give us instead squared off boxes of men and women. And we, both men and women, become prisoners of these boxes. Now, there was a very interesting experiment that was done a, a few years ago by some researchers, I believe it was at Harvard University. And they decided they want to study aggressive behavior among college-aged men and women and see if there were any differences between them uh, in terms of their behavior. So they measured aggressiveness by measuring how willing students were to drop bombs in a video. So what did they observe? They noticed that when male students knew that they were observed, they were significantly more aggressive than the women. And hence, they really conform to our stereotypes and their own stereotypes. However, these differences in behavior disappeared when the game was played anonymously. As a matter of fact, in the anonymous game, women were slightly more aggressive. So I think this is an example and an illustration, if you want, that behavior is greatly dependent on gender and social expectations. Now, gender assignments begin at birth, and sometimes even before birth, when parents are looking for a name for their child. It is taught in schools. It is reinforced in our communities, where gender-conforming behavior is often rewarded, and gender-deviant behavior is punished. <coughs> but I think the good news is that gender expectations and gender roles changed by culture and over time. Gender roles and norms are not static. You know, just think about it in your own lives. You know, think about your parents, your grandparents, and how each of them looked at gender roles and norms. What kind of expectations there were. What kind of career paths your parents or grandparents thought you should have, depending on whether you were a boy or a girl. So my main argument here is that gender is a social construct. And as a social construct, it is all about power. It begins with the family, you know, where in a very traditional manner, the man is often the head of the household. But our leisure and play activities are also very gendered. The types of sports we play, work is very gendered. We still have predominantly male or female professions and occupations. And often this results in unequal pay. And of course, politics is greatly gendered and remains predominantly male. Uh, think also maybe at the Me Too movement. Uh, and the sexual abuse it exposes. Now, the Me Too movement is really all about gender and has very little to do about sex. Uh, it is really about the abuses of power. So let me leave you with this 
definition of gender by two American sociologists, Kenneth West and Sarah Fensterwinkel. And I think their definition clearly situates gender as part of our social order. And gender as a mechanism within societies by which power is exercised and inequality is reproduced. And virtually every society known to us is founded upon assumption of gender differences and the politics of gender inequalities. Many of the institutions in our lives, in our societies, have incorporated these gender norms and perpetuate these unequal gender relations. And there is no country in the world, not even Sweden or Norway, that has achieved gender equality. And that is one of the reasons why I think it is so critically important to look at gender when we study political science. And that is why I think gender is such a key element when we look at international affairs. But it's only really in the 1990s that academics and policy <coughs> start paying attention to gender. First in the economic realm, and then secondly in the political and international affairs. Now I know that gender intersects with other key identity markers, such as age, race, ethnicity, etc. But in this talk I really want to focus on gender. And I want to do so because of its universality and the universality of its impact on the lives of human beings. So with this in mind, let me now turn to the global trends and challenges that will define peace and security in the 21st century. <coughs> so how should we think about these trends and these factors? We know that the security environment, be it in the Americas, Asia, Africa, or Europe, is a highly complex environment. And I think Shadman Bashir this morning clearly illustrated how the current security environment is a very complex environment. It is a complex environment with many intersecting issues and many actors, governmental actors, non-governmental <coughs> actors, local actors, national actors, global actors. So how should we organize our thoughts when thinking about these challenges? I want to propose think about these challenges along four main axes. Or if you want, think about it like a coat hanger. It has four main pegs. We have challenges that have to do with people. We have challenges that have to do with economics. We have challenges that have to do with governance. And lastly, we have challenges that have to do with security, physical security, war, and violent conflict. And what I'm arguing is that all these challenges have important gender dimensions. The impact of these challenges on men and women is different. And hence our policy responses need to take this into account. Unfortunately, in many instances, these gender dimensions are ignored, both by academics and by policymakers. And I would say, as a result, our policy responses falter. So let us look more specifically at these challenges. And let's start with the people challenge. There are basically three main issues here. There's the issue of population growth, the issue of distribution, and the issue of movement. The world population continues to grow. Today we have 7.6 billion people by 2050 that will be 9.8 billion. And, you know, by the end of the century, we are around 11 uh, plus billion. The bad news of this population growth is that the growth of this population will be predominantly in the developing world. That is, that part of the world that is least equipped to deal with more people. And women, because of their position 
in many societies will be most effective. Now, I'm sure you've all heard about youth villages and the economic and social consequences of the graying population. We talk less about gender imbalances. Yet, gender imbalances are stark in the Middle East, in Asia, and the Caucasus. And they have not only social economic consequences, but also foreign policy consequences. What are we talking about here? Gender balances, imbalances come about because of discrimination against girls and the deliberate killing of girls. In China, each year, some 39,000 girls die before their first birthday, simply because their parents do not give the same care as they do to boys. In Armenia, sex-selective abortions, legally prohibited, have led to regions where we see 120 boys being born versus 100 girls. We talk about the 80 to 100 million girls in India and China that are missing. Now, research by people like Valerie Hudson, Andrea Dembour, Mary Caprioli, and others have shown that when you have a society where the gender balance is disturbed, you not only get all sorts of social stresses and economic problems, but gender balances, imbalances, also have an effect on the foreign policy of states. Research suggests that gender imbalances may lead states to become more autocratic. Abnormal sex ratios and the surplus of young adult men may aggravate the likelihood of instability and armed aggression. Caprioli, for instance, has shown strong correlations between domestic gender inequalities and higher levels of state conflict and insecurity. In other words, this research shows that male-female relations within societies have an effect on foreign relations, <coughs> including the propensity of violent conflict. Let's move to our second challenge that has to deal with economics. Now, economic growth is key to poverty reduction. And I think we've made actually quite some progress in this regard. Since 1990, extreme poverty has declined from 1.9 billion people to 644 million people. So that's quite an achievement. Unfortunately, our poverty measurements often fail to capture the whole picture of poverty. They fail to cover the feminization of poverty. They fail to show that women represent disproportionate percentages of the world's poor. <laughs> and this is not only a consequence of the lack of income, but also the lack of access to income due to gender biases in society and gender biases in government policies. Women have less access to land, to water, to financial resources. McKinsey, which is a big consulting company, has calculated that equality for women in the labor force would add up to 28 trillion to the global economy by 2025. That's about a third of the economy. That's huge. Now, technology is also a major engine of economic growth, but unfortunately, we see there are also great gender imbalances. <coughs> We see very few women working in technology. And as a result, uh, the types of technologies that are being developed uh, often have a gender bias. And I think uh, scientists within the tech, uh, the tech sphere and arena are starting to recognize this. Now, new economic development, economic development, economic growth is necessary because we have more people. Uh, but that will also lead to increased energy consumption and that will put great strain on the environment. Climate change. Climate change will affect all of us 
but women are generally more vulnerable to its effects. Women, as I said already, form a disproportionately large share of the poor and are often highly dependent on local natural resources for their livelihood. Drought, uncertain rainfall, deforestation make it harder to secure these resources. In addition, women have little access to decision-making structures. That brings us to our third challenge that has to do with governance. Now, we have to deal here with three related challenges, and I think uh, Shadman Bashir uh, touched upon this also earlier this morning. There is the challenge of the fragile state, the challenge of corruption, and lastly, the lack of democratic procedures or the lack of the rule of law. The Fund for Peace has estimated that out of the 193 UN member states, only 54 are considered stable. According to Transparency International, corruption is a serious problem in 114 states. And lastly, Freedom House reports that in 2017, democracy faced its most serious crisis in decades. 71 countries suffered net decline in political rights and civil liberties. Just this week, we saw an illustration of this as the Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed to do away with term limits. Having been preceded by Sisi in Egypt, Putin in Russia, and Erdogan in Turkey. In sum, our governance structures and our governance problems are real and they are severe. What is striking when we look at governments is that everywhere the gender imbalances are huge, long-standing, and persistent. As of January 2017, we only had about worldwide 23% of women parliamentarians. Only 6% of heads of state or heads of government are women. Now we know and research has shown that equal participation of women and men in politics is an important condition for effective de democracy and good governance. There is also <laughs> growing consensus and a large body of evidence, including research by the World Bank, that shows that countries with more, more women involved in government or parliament are less prone to corruption. But gender equality at the political level remains very hard to achieve. Indeed, it goes to the heart of the power equation. And a rebalancing means that some will lose power. And I think that's one of the reasons why this is so difficult. Our fourth main challenge is about security, physical security, about violent conflict and war. We have interstate wars, intrastate wars, and transnational security challenges such as terrorism. Overlaying these challenges are the way we wage war, is the kind of weapons, nuclear weapons, technological security challenges, autonomous weapons, drones, cyber warfare, artificial intelligence. Now, since the end of the 1990s, and with the end of the Cold War, we have seen a shift in the security challenges from interstate to intrastate. Since the 1990s, the predominant security challenge is no longer war between states, but war within states. Wars that often see deliberate attacks on civilians. Now, the changing nature of armed movement has also led, at an analytical or conceptual level, to a shift in perspective whereby security is seen no longer just in military terms, but also in non-military terms. A shift that led to a focus from the security of states to a focus on the individual and the relations between individuals 
and groups. It led to a focus on human security instead of state security. And of course, the focus on human security then opens up the door to studying the role of gender in conflict, including conflict-related sexual violence. So in the 1990s, policymakers slowly recognized that war has different impacts on men and women, and that wars often change the responsibilities of men and women and overturn gender stereotypical roles. Unfortunately, we're not taking advantage of these opportunities. So, we have seen that in all these different security challenges, the gender dimension is actually quite important. <coughs> the question is, have our international political and legal frameworks to deal with these challenges taken gender into account? And the short answer is, are they? Prior to 1995, the focus was not on gender, but on women. And women were often seen as victims that needed protection rather than as actors, people that needed to be included in decision making. Also, it is not until the mid-1990s that the gender dimensions of international security challenges are being considered. Now, why do things change in the 90s? What happens in the 1990s? There are basically three things. One is the end of the Cold War. Second, as I mentioned already, is the changing nature of the predominant security challenge. This shift from interstate to interstate. And lastly, at an operational level, the UN is increasingly being asked to intervene to help solve these problems. Unfortunately, the results, the conflict resolution results of the UN in the 1990s weren't very encouraging. Indeed, many of the conflicts that were brokered by the UN in the early 90s would relapse into conflict three to five years later. Now, there are, of course, many reasons why this happened. But one of the reasons this happened was that these peace negotiations, these peace processes, were far from inclusive. They only included warring parties. They looked like the pictures on the slide. Women, even if they had been present during the struggle, would be marginalized and excluded when it came to international negotiations. International actors would seek out the loudest and the most violent, not necessarily the most legitimate. But in the 1990s, women started to rebel and demanded to be heard. They questioned traditional gender roles that kept them outside the goals of power. And so in the remainder of my talk, I want to focus on the international efforts to integrate a gender perspective in conflict resolution efforts in peace and security negotiations. And I want to focus on Resolution 1325 and what we call the Women's Peace and Security Agenda. So as I said, in the 1990s, women started to rebel. And uh, it is really in 1995 that these efforts of women's organizations come together in the fourth conference on women in Beijing. Now, in 1995, there were about 17,000 participants to this conference. And there were about 30,000 activists at the center of the Beijing. 30,000 activists, mostly women. And for the first time in 1995, an international conference recognized that gender matters when we're dealing with peace and security issues. For the first time, women were seen not just as victims, but also as agents of change. 1995, the Beijing Conference also saw a memorable speech by the woman on the right, and she made world headlines when she declared 
Let it be that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights once and for all. Beijing ultimately led in October 2000 to the adoption of this UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Now the adoption of this resolution was the result of three developments coming together. One, as I mentioned, the mobilization of these women's organizations in response to the many intrastate conflicts that erupted in the 1990s. Second was the extreme violence of a lot of these conflicts in the 1990s, and in particular the sexual violence and the rape that we saw happening in these conflicts. And third was the recognition by the UN that the majority of the peace deals that it had broken fell apart after three to five years. And women's organizations argued that these peace deals were not inclusive and failed to take a general perspective into account. They failed to recognize the particular interests, problems, and rights of men and women. And they failed to recognize that societies where violence against women is okay, that those societies are inherently violent and unstable. With the adoption of Resolution 1325, the UN Security Council, that highest body of our global government system, for the first time recognizes, one, the tremendous and inordinate amount of suffering endured by women in war, and the need for better protection and prevention of sexual violence. Second, it realized and recognized that lasting peace could only be obtained if all people in society were involved. The Council recognized that not including 50% of the population led to ineffective and unstable peace agreements. And it recognized that women needed to be at the peace negotiating table. No peace without gender equality, no peace without women. The resolution also recognized that it was important to get more women into security institutions like the military and the police. And lastly, the Council recognized that conflict prevention and conflict resolution could only be successful if it integrated a gender perspective and takes into account how gender relations can fuel conflict. <coughs> But there are basically two ideas you know, at the heart of this resolution. First is the importance of gender balance in decision making, including not just men, but also women. And the second is that gender perspectives matter when we are examining international security challenges. You know, men and women are differently impacted by for instance, men are more likely to voluntarily leave their homes and go to the battlefield and probably die in the battlefield. Women are more likely to be forced for their home and in their flight be subject to sexual violence. Gender perspectives are also critically important for military operations. If I'm a peacekeeper and I'm patrolling the streets in a community, I need to be attentive to gender. Who is walking and playing in the streets? If I just think in terms of people, I might miss that at a certain moment women and children are missing, are absent, and hence I might miss an important indicator for future trouble. A gender perspective tells us things about the tactical, operational, and strategic levels. And I've already mentioned the uh, research by Valerie Hudson and Andrea Tabor on how gender imbalances affect social stability. Resolution 1325 also underscored the importance of gender mainstream, that is, the importance of putting into place policies and programs that advance gender equality. Now, what has happened since the adoption of this resolution? First of all, 
The council has adopted seven more resolutions. And together, all these resolutions, we call them and we refer to them as the Women's and Security Agenda. Second, uh, in 2004, the council invites member states to adopt national action plans for the uh, implementation of this resolution. The U.S. adopted the National Action Plan in 2011. This plan was revised in 2016. And just last October, the October 2017, the U.S. Congress adopt, has adopted the Women, Peace and Security Act, which was signed by President Trump, and which requires the U.S. government to develop a strategy around women, peace and security. Uh, we see the establishment in 20, 2009 of a special representative to deal with the issues of sexual violence. And I think Jillian, uh, you have studied this issue in particular. Um, 2010, we see the establishment of a UN organization dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women. And then lastly, in 2015, the UN embarks on a comprehensive review of all its peace and security related efforts. It led to three major reports, a HIPPO, what we call the HIPPO report on peacekeeping operation, a report on the peace building commission, the sort of non-military side of, of peace, uh, peace efforts by the UN, and a report on the implementation of Resolution 1325, a report we usually refer to as the Global Studies. The Global study. Now, all of these three major reports have emphasized the importance of gender equality, the importance of gender perspectives, uh, that is, the importance of looking at problems through a gender lens, and gender mainstreaming that is putting into place policies and programs that advance gender equality. However, the overriding conclusion of the global study that focused on 1325 was that after 15 years, implementation of this resolution remained problematic. Now, there's both good news and bad news. The good news is that actually some 73 countries have adopted national action plans. And many regional organizations have as well, including an organization like NATO. At a rhetorical level, policymakers have all bought into gender equality and the women's and security agenda. In addition, a lot of attention these past 15 years have focused on sexual violence and focused on the protection pillar of this revolution. And there were two reasons why there's so much focus on the protection pillar of this resolution. First is that it got very vocal advocates, uh, including a vocal advocate in the form of Angelina Jolie, who together with the UK foreign minister uh, started an important initiative in this regard. And the second reason why you know this issue got a lot of attention is that Focusing on sexual violence is less threatening than focusing on participation. Um, particularly if sexual violence in conflict is seen as the result of some bad apples, instead of a symptom of larger structural inequalities. Now the bad news is on the participation side. The number of female negotiators at the peace tables has not changed. The different attempts and talks around the Syria conflict uh, have not included women. The number of women in the security sector remains extremely low, around 6 to 10 percent in Europe, and there are only about 3 percent women in UN peacekeeping operations. These national action plans by these 73 states are also notoriously uh, in not allocating any real resources. And then there is a general lack of understanding of what gender really means. Um, as I have said before, most academic and policy discussions about international security challenges, particularly here in the United States, ignore gender perspectives. 
There was a survey by the New America Foundation that found that the majority of U.S. national security policy makers had little knowledge or understanding of gender. And most policy makers, when we said gender, they thought you were talking about women. Now, this lack of understanding is not just in the U.S., it's, it's worldwide. Um, and I, I think we can say that most policymakers and experts in the traditional security community remain oblivious to the gender dimensions of international peace and security. And for many, this agenda remains the women's agenda and is henceforth easily sidelined. So what is the way forward? The UN has laid out the way forward in 2015, and in particular for this agenda in another resolution, 2042, where it asked member states to really take gender perspectives into account when you deal with international security challenges, particular in the, uh, also when we're dealing with terrorism <coughs> and violent extremism. But I think more generally, for this agenda to announce, we, the people who care about this agenda, we need to emphasize that this is not just a women's agenda, but also, and importantly, a peace and security agenda. Gender inequalities and gender-based violence are indicative of dysfunctional and disruptive patterns of domination that make interstate and intrastate aggression more likely. And to underscore this point, the, what we sometimes call the WPS community needs to reframe, I think, this agenda into a, what I call, WPS plus GPS agenda. That is an agenda that recognizes that a focus on women is important, but it's not sufficient. To fully address security challenges in the 21st century, the focus also needs to be on gender. That is, on the power structures that define and defy, I would say, international peace and security. Power structures that can often be traced to power structures within the household, traced to male-female relations in each one of our societies. In addition, I think that the gender community, the WPS community, the people who have been, the women's organizations who have been working on this agenda, and the traditional security community need to build bridges amongst each other. Currently, they're not talking to each other. And it is as if we're speaking different languages, even if we speak in the English language. And lastly, I think we need to advance our understanding and knowledge about these gender dimensions of international security challenges. This is a very emerging field in the international affairs uh, and uh, security studies domain. Uh, but we need more, uh, more research, and I think we all need to invest in the next generation of scholars and policy makers, because only then can the repressive forces that want women to remain subordinate to men be stopped. And only then will the truly transformative nature of this UN Security Council resolution become a reality. With that, I will stop here and I will be happy to answer any questions.
and on the education of, um, of the U.S. Congress. So the, big, the good news on the U.S. side is that the National Action Plan was an executive order by the President. Now, the Women, Peace and Security Act, signed by President Trump, is law. And so by law, the U.S. government is now required to submit a plan that says how the State Department, how the Defense Department, how USAID, the Development Agency, uh, and other arms of government are going to implement this agenda. How are they introducing gender equality in their policies? How are they going to make sure that their policies won't have regressive impacts? How are they going to ensure within their own structures that there is gender balance, that military get taught about gender perspectives? Uh, and so we are currently in the process of um, helping the U.S. government uh, to think about what the key aspects of such a strategy should look like. And this effort is being organized within the U.S. Civil Society Working Group on Women, Peace, and Security. Uh, and so we're currently, so civil society organizations themselves are thinking, what are the main things that we think should be in there? And what is... Um, feasible within the, uh, the current US government. So I think the good news is the fact that it is small and it can't be easily overturned. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, please. Uh, a comment actually, and I was looking at the national security point uh, quite a bit. Um, women actually are more dangerous uh, when they're part of the Kurdish Ashwaka because the belief is that when we shoot an ISIS uh, military or ISIS fighter, he cannot go to heaven. So they end up more dangerous for ISIS than actually the male snipers. So that may be even more dangerous for that movie. So let me tell you, I am not at all, and most of my colleagues, we are not at all making an argument that women are more peaceful. Not at all. Uh, what we're saying is, there are gender relations. These gender relations are really about power. And uh, we're not saying, we are only saying, well, the one on top is generally you know, doing something wrong. So I'm not making any argument about women being more peaceful. I just, it's neither here nor there. In terms of women and terrorism, and I've actually worked a little bit on this, uh, ISIS is a very good example. Um, ISIS understood gender way better than our governments in the U.S. or in Europe. How to use gender when you want to recruit people to your organization. And they play the gender card, if you want, extremely well. They understood how they had to play this for young men. You know, playing up hyper-masculinity, uh, you know, you be an important part of, of society, it's going to be fun, it's going to be, you know, adventurous. And they play on um, the gender stereotypes for women. Uh, a lot of women, in particular women, I think, in uh, Islamic women in the U.S. or in, in Europe, feel sort of slighted by the society around them. Uh, not being recognized. Uh, sometimes also they feel that they're sort of neither here nor there. They have a conflict both with society and their families. And so ISIS is playing on this beautifully by saying, come to us, we recognize you. We need you, mothers of our new nation. I mean, ISIS understood, uh, and that was, I think, the real sort of draw of ISIS is that it wanted to create a society, a real state. And of course, in a state, you need women. Because you need women, you need children. And up until now, it's women who make the children. And so ISIS has been very good in manipulating
facilitating these gender, uh, both the gender grievances and the gender expectations of both men and women. Um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of young people, in particular when they went to uh, Syria, uh, then realized that it wasn't all that great as was portrayed. But, They'd be very effective. And of course, the terrorist organizations themselves, uh, you know, are doing that as well. Boko Haram is another example. Any other question, comment? Yes, please. I'm just wondering, um, I, thought, I thought you almost said, right when you had your last slide, um, it seemed like you were saying that, that everybody, I think, realizes that rape is usually a part of the war, and sexual violence is a part of war. But I'm wondering to what extent is sexual violence actually the cause of war? Or at least that domination model of that domination. And I wonder if the what of that domination model is it sexually violent. And I just wonder what could you agree to wish that to be? Well, I think research really suggests that societies when you have violence against women, um, are inherently unstable societies. And what you see is when sexual violence is being used as a tactic of war, uh, it's really all about power. Uh, so I think you're, you're exactly right. Also, uh, you know, one often thinks that sexual violence or rape, it's inevitable. You know, there's this idea boys will be boys and they can't be uh, contained. Uh, first of all, I think you know, having a really low opinion of the boys. And, and I tell this when I speak with military uh, military people, when I do a, a talk for a, a military, we actually see great variation in conflicts. Rape is not always used in conflict. And there are different graduations how uh, this is used, you know, whether it's used at a strategic level or whether it is just uh, allowed. But there are also conflicts where there's no way and sexual violence. So sexual violence is not inevitable of war, but sexual violence by itself within societies is trouble. Any other questions, comments? Let me leave you there with maybe three thoughts. I hope that at the end of this talk, um, you come away with a sense, you will now know that gender is not women. It doesn't equal women, but gender is really about power. Second, you all now know that UN Security Council Resolution 1325 or 1325 is not the name of a new beer or a new soda. 1325 is about women, peace, and security. And when we say women, peace, and security, it is about gender equality. And the conviction and the assumption that if you really want to have peace, you need to have gender equality. Gender inequality creates violence. And lastly, Gender equality is a problem not just for the developing but also for the for us here in the United States, for us in Europe. And we can all contribute, and I think we must all contribute, to make this world a better place. And we can start at home and in our communities and address the gender inequalities that we see around us. Uh, and so I hope that those three thoughts will remain with you when you um, think about this maybe later or during this history, Women's History Month uh, for the month of March. Thank you so much.